right. Hello and welcome to the third Stratcom panel titled Digital Strategies Reloading. As we all know, communication technologies are constantly evolving, changing and renewing themselves. This has accelerated the globalization process and as a result our world has become smaller as distances have shrunk. Our speakers on this panel will discuss the digital strategies of states, international organizations and corporations in the digital age. I'm joined by Miklos Gaspar, he's the head of digital communications at the International Atomic Energy Agency based in Vienna. Miklos ran key strategic corporate projects at the International Trade Center and organized the World Export Development Forum, ITC's flagship event in Rwanda. It was the large, largest such ever event ever held. Matthias Lufkins, he's a social media architect at DigiTips, a boutique PR agency advising a range of corporations, UN agencies and non-profit organizations on the best use of social media. Matthias is best known for having created Tweeplomagy, a study which looks at how governments and international organizations use digital platforms. Nancy Groves, Nancy Lee's digital communications strategy for the United Nations Environment Program. Her unit manages all web, social media and internal communications activities and coordinates UNEP's outreach and responses to journalists and media partnerships. Sam Kwan Kruger has over 20 years of experience in digital marketing and strategic communications for large organizations and brands such as UNICEF, E-Trade and JP Morgan Chase. He's currently the head of digital communications at the United Nations Development Program. And last but not least, Daria Santuji. Daria is an international communication strategist with extensive experience in bringing innovation to corporate communication with a digital focus. She currently works for European Training Foundation, an EU agency, where she's in charge of strategic communications, press services, social media management, and the coordination of thematic campaigns for outreach in the EU neighboring countries. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Now, I'd like to start with Miklos, please. Miklos, the increasing impact of digitalization is undeniable, but what kind of challenges and opportunities are created by digitalization? Uh, thank, thank you for that question. So indeed, digitalization has become the new norm, and it is creating both challenges and opportunities, and in some ways, they are the same. That there are no limits. You can reach anybody. There is no topic that's niche enough for there not to be a community uh, in, 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 the in the digital landscape. Uh, it also allows organizations like the ones I work for and, and my colleagues on this panel work for to reach out directly uh, to, to audiences that traditionally you could have only been able to reach via intermediaries like the press. Uh, at the same time, digitalization also creates bubbles. People only talk to the people, only hear from people that think the same as themselves. So, you have more opportunities to change minds on the one hand. On the other hand, it's sometimes harder to penetrate these bubbles because uh, when all they had was a news channel on TV, well, that covered every point of view. Now that they can pick from among many, many digital channels, they will pick the one that only oftentimes uh, broadcast the views that they agree with. Interesting. Is there anything you'd like to add to that question, Matthias? I think about the, the uh, opportunities and challenges is that I remember when I put the World Economic Forum on social media back in 2006, um, I was told, Matthias, you know, why would we put our panels onto YouTube? Because the students watching YouTube, they're not our target audience. Uh, well, that target audience has grown up. They are now the CEOs going to Davos to the annual meeting uh, every year in Switzerland. So I think, you know, we have to be where the audience is, and the audience is on social media. You know, just to give you an idea, the two biggest countries in the world are number one, Facebook, with over two billion active monthly users, and number two is YouTube. So it's kind of obvious that we have to, to be there. And the, the other opportunity uh, that I found out really early is that we, you know, function like a newsroom. Uh, we have to be like a newsroom. Um, and work like a newsroom um, because you know that's what media companies do. So I'm, I'm a former journalist, and by doing that, we kind of disintermediated the media. Uh, now the media is following 
organizations on Twitter, on Facebook, and you know, all the other channels. Um, before, it was just, you know, here's the press release, but now, you know, we're actually producing the news all the time. Very true. Um, Sam, how would you like to answer that? What kind of challenges and opportunities are created by digitalization? Yeah, thank you for inviting me to today's event. Um, I think for companies, organizations that are digitalizing, the opportunity is greater collaboration. I know that the technology for a long time has... Oh, can you hear me, by the way? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so for the longest time, technology has enabled collaboration, but I think the latest uh, generation of tools uh, are showing greater uh, uh, abilities to great, create deeper experiences when it comes to collaboration, uh, in the right hands, that is. So I can jump on a Zoom call like we're on now. I can present a file that I'm working on. Uh, those that are in the meeting have access to that same file because it's cloud-based, and we're editing things as we're talking, but in different locations. And that's just editing, for example. There are tools uh, in communications for production, uh, for project management, for a variety of uh, ways in which uh, we work today. And it, uh, today's generation of tools, if, they did, if they're integrated properly, properly uh, can be very powerful. Now, I think the challenge with digitalization, and you said this early on in the introduction, is that technology is constantly evolving and changing. And to keep at pace with that is very difficult. Large companies, large organizations, they have to think through a process of testing and deciding what is the most suitable technology to fit into their environment. And they have to do this at pace with all the changes that are happening. And so how do they think through, okay, what is appropriate for my multinational company or my global organization? And how quickly and, uh, do, do I introduce these uh, adaptations to uh, a, a staff? Like in the case of the UNDP, there are 17,000 people in the organization. So it can be tricky. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge challenge for them. Interesting. Daria, anything you'd like to add? Yes, um, thank you very much. Good afternoon and uh, to Naidin. I don't know if that's correct in Turkish. And uh, thanks a lot to the Director of Communications of the Presidency of the Republic of Turkey for the invite. Yeah, I mean, what I'd like to add is that um, seeing from the perspective of uh, the organization for which I work, the European Training Foundation, which is helping countries in the EU neighborhood develop education and labor market systems, uh, we've seen that uh, digital communication could be used strategically, for example, during the pandemic, to help the learning community learn on being strategic through digital and beyond. Um, I, I'd like to, to frame this, this point with, with an example. When, when, the, when the pandemic first hit, um, there were 1.5 billion students in 160 countries who had been forced to study at home. And uh, as an organization dealing with the learners community, we asked ourselves how can we help them? And uh, being located in Italy, which is the first new country to be in a lockdown, we uh, reflected on how to transform, how to reload our digital strategies to the service of uh, society. Uh, we had initiated an initiative which is uh, called Learning Connect. It was a campaign to uh, engage the learners community from anywhere beyond the countries in which we do um, operate directly. And uh, that was precisely meant to create an, a connection across all those who were being facing the consequences of the pandemic. Um, this is to say uh, that in, in my opinion, digital communication in these ages, in this era which we are uh, exploring, uh, still has got value, uh, not necessarily because of the technicalities which are connected to digital, but because it is a means to connect societies. And uh, the conclusions we draw uh, from the experience we've been running are that 
this is a moment in which we need to explore way further the audiences with uh, whom we try to connect because each of us is changing uh, the context in which he or she lives and uh, this is absolutely necessary in order to understand better the personas to whom we are communicating and reach uh, better um, results. Uh, linking to what a colleague mentioned earlier on, uh, it's true in, in the past and, and the, the area in which we work, which is learning. In the past, digital learning used to be the, the privilege of an inner circle of tech gurus, and now, theoretically, it belongs to everyone by uh, keeping in mind the point that uh, there are uh, students and teachers who still do not have access to the internet nor have the means. So uh, digital, uh, to conclude, was relevant, yes, is relevant, yes, it is sufficient, no. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Daria. Nancy, how would you like to answer that? Yes, thanks for having me, and hello, everyone. I think, you know, on the case of where I work at the UN Environment Program and also for the UN Secretariat as a whole, the major challenge is just acknowledging that there's no one size fits all approach or audience. So for example, for the UN Environment Program, a lot of our communi communications efforts are designed for audiences in developed countries as populations there have an outsized impact on environmental crises, greenhouse gas emissions, producing all kinds of waste. But some developing countries are feeling the impacts with droughts and unprecedented floods, both of which we have seen in Kenya, where I'm speaking to you from today. So this reality really outstrips the capacity and expertise of our staff to create so many different pieces of content, which might resonate with all of these audiences. So uh, there's also a huge problem of disinformation. You know, some studies show that climate disinformation in particular is rather well-funded and well-organized, and we certainly cannot compete. So what can be done? I mean, I don't have the answer, but one way we have tried to address this is by working with the platforms themselves. No one knows more about how to maximize outreach than they do. For example, we at UNEP, along with a number of UN entities and organizations working on the climate crisis, have joined forces with Facebook on a project called the Climate Science Center. Using their insights about their audiences and their unprecedented reach, we've gone through our products to identify you know, what needs to be prioritized for featuring on this platform where like it or not, people are getting a huge amount of their information. So depending on where you are in the world, you will see something tailored to you. In certain countries, you might see a more data heavy version of the app that also highlights content about sustainable consumption. But if you're in a part of the world where data is expensive compared to your income or Wi-Fi or energy access is much more limited, you see a lighter version, but then also tailored content. For example, if you don't have options about what to buy or finances, our messaging on sustainable consumption makes no sense to you. So it's good for us to use our really limited internal resources to communicate in this way. Thank you so much, Nancy. Miklos, once again, starting with you, I'd like to ask all our, question, all our guests this question. What effect does digitalization have on our social, political, and economic habits? So, um let, let me give you this time an experience from my own work. I work in nuclear communications as head of digital for the International Atomic Energy Agency. And, and you know, one aspect that digitalization has is that people have more easily access to more or easier access to all kinds of news, all kinds of information, including fake news and fake information, as our, our you know, keynote speakers discussed this morning. So this is very true about nuclear, that uh, lots of you know, incorrect uh, assumptions, information um, is, is present on the internet, and our job as communicators is to come back with scientific facts and, and information that's actually correct and spread it through various channels that you can reach these people, social media, you know, search engine optimized websites, so that you can enter these bubbles and you can counter, try, do your best to counter the, the, the misinformation. And this trend is true not just in my area, but in really many other areas. And so some of those you know, political, economic, social uh, changes uh, are, are fueled 
by, by a lot of misinformation that you know, we who know uh, need to do our best to counter. Interesting. Um, I'd like to ask the same question to you, Matthias. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> one of the aspects is that we don't have much time. Um, basically, our attention span has become so short. You know, it's, uh, our attention span is as long as uh, almost a Vine video. Okay, Vine doesn't exist anymore, but uh, kind of a, a 10 second uh, TikTok, you know, and this is really, you know, I think a key change, you know, if I look at my, my children, you know, they're on their devices, you know, like all the time, constantly, I, I sometimes think, you know, and how do we, you know, how do we get that quality time back, you know, because, um, you know, so that we're not always connected, you know, either to screens or to Alexa and, and so on. So I think this is, this is one of the, the key aspects in terms of communicators, obviously, our mission is we have to reach that, you know, audience. We have to get their attention and how do we do that, uh, I think, and, and that's a challenge. So, you know, kind of there's, on the one side, you know, we as, as users are, don't, you know, don't, you know, we cannot disconnect anymore, almost. Uh, on the other side, as communicators, we want exactly to reach these audiences, and the younger, the, the better, you know. We want to reach the 12-year-olds on, on TikTok in order to spread the messages for our organizations. For sure, what do you think could be done? Like, how can we use digitalization as, you know, to benefit family, for example, family life? I think digital consumption has to be used in, has to be taught in schools. And, you know, I'm a big advocate that we have to teach our children how to, you know, what to post on Twitter, what to post on Facebook, Instagram, you know, Snapchat, whatever, really teaching them. The problem is our teachers weren't, you know, did not grow up with, with the digital channels. They were thrown into these digital channels and, you know, in, often they say, oh, no, we don't want to get involved, you know, but really kind of helping, you know, helping users to use these tools. Uh, you know, what, what can you post? You know, what pictures are you allowed to post? Um, and if you, if you use, like, my idea was when my children were younger in middle school, why don't we do a school newspaper based on a Facebook page, you know? Um, well, there is no, you don't, you know, basically the reaction from parents was absolutely, you know, how dare you want to put our children on, on Facebook? That wasn't my mission. My mission was really kind of to explain the 12 and 13 year olds, you know, this is how you manage a Facebook page. And even if you look at, you know, um, if you're a communicator, even if you're a baker, you know, the, as a baker, you want to have your bakery on Facebook, uh, on Google, obviously, in order to attract, attract the, the, your customers, you know, when they, when they come by, or even just to remind them, you know, come and, you know, have a coffee in the, in the, in the bakery. So kind of, you need to know as a baker how to set up a Facebook page. You know, what, 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 and what, how do you communicate? And I think this is really key. Communication should be part of the curriculum uh, in schools, full stop. Totally, I agree completely. Um, Sam, how would you like to answer that? What kind of challenges and opportunities are created by digitalization? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, a, a couple of the panels have already mentioned this, but I wanna restate this uh, with more emphasis that even though there is so much promise and potential with digitalization, it's quite uneven. And there are those that have and those that don't have. The ones that have, have more advanced technology, better infrastructure, greater knowledge. The ones that don't have are falling behind. Uh, these inequities are creating a digital divide. And we see the divide at the local level, national level, regional and global levels. Um, so while there's so much promise, we do need to make sure that we share the, uh, that, that promise and potential of digitalization across the board. Thank you, Sam. Daria, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. While, uh, while you were uh, answering to, to this question, an, an additional point came to my mind. Because uh, if we think of the uh, opportunities from the, the digitalization, then, for example, seen from the perspective of uh, the work of the, of the European Training Foundation, we see the opportunity for sharing uh, solutions 
and best practices across countries which, say, in the face of the pandemic are facing or might be facing similar issues. But other aspects which we would like to and we should uh, put in the discussion are on one side, like Sam just said, uh, the lack of, digital, of digitization, which is uh, having some countries or some specific groups of populations which are lagging behind. And as Matthias flagged earlier on, the excess of digitization is also an issue because of the reduced attention span and the difficulty, for example, in selecting what's relevant and what's not. And at last, an aspect which is at the core of the action, again, of the European Training Foundation, because we work a lot on vocational education and training, is what it is difficult by its own nature to become digitalized, which is, for example, technical learning. So I would say we have a number of challenges and opportunities, and I think communicators could uh, contribute enormously to uh, discussions as such, given their horizontal overview and their natural capability and skills uh, for uh, providing innovative eyes to, to the subject. What's relevant and fundamental is keeping a very honest and horizontal discussion as it's happening now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daria. Nancy. Sure. So I already mentioned, you know, that the UN or UNEP is the UN's lead scientific program when it comes to, you know, pulling together information on uh, the triple planetary crises. But we also host the secretariats of 14 multilateral environmental agreements, which are staffed with experts on international law. So internally, we are sitting on huge amounts of information and data that we need to figure out how to make accessible to every audience that needs it whether it's researchers, journalists, students, policymakers, and of course the young people who have been so effective at raising their voices on the climate crisis. So a major challenge for us as communicators in this digital landscape is to really critically pull out the information from these experts who know much more about the crisis than I do. So we can get it into the conversations that make the most sense and that can lead to lasting and impactful change, which is ideally better policy decisions by governments and businesses based on really sound science. So some of these internal experts put together these UN reports and resources, they don't understand communications at all, maybe even not the best way to put information online in a digital context. So we really need to figure out how to speak their language first so then we can then speak you know, to people who need this information outside of our organization. On the other hand, you have others who are so in love with communications and then you have to temper their expectations because they may not understand why you know, one specific piece of information is not going to go viral no matter how good a communicator you are. So there's just a lot of this internal work that we need to do to make our external communications as effective as possible so much savvy communications expertise to know when to join a conversation and when not to join it. Of course, a mistake could you know, set you back in, in incalculable ways. Um, so that's really, I think, one of our major challenges as well. Right, thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, Matthias, once again, starting with you, I'd like to take your final remarks on any subject that you'd like regarding this topic. I'm sorry, not Matthias, uh, Miklos. <laughs> Well, um, th thank you. So I'd like to add to actually what Matthias started talking about. You, you, you know, you asked about families. So certainly one issue is this uh, generational divide uh, that, that kids are, are either using digitalization too much or, or, as Sam has said, they don't have access and they don't use it at all. And what I'd like to add to what Matthias said is to teach them how to responsibly uh, use, use digital devices and, and digital communication and that to you know, educate them so that their lives don't become just totally digital, but they still, you know, go out to play, and that we as parents and teachers still take them to, you know, do, do, do other activities so they grow up in a, healthy, in a healthy way. I reckon that's not too easy, though, right? Yes, that's right. Trial and error. Right. Yeah. True. Uh, Matthias, <laughs> excuse me for the last uh, confusing your name. Yeah, I think what, you know, what I wish, you know, we would do more often as communicators is ask our audience, not just, you know, you know, kind of 
you know, like this post or, you know, kind of this call to action that we all have in, in our social media posts, but really kind of connect with our audience and ask them what they want. You know, it's simple as that. Um, I don't think we do that enough. You know, just to, yes, we, do, we will do polls and, and so, you know, sorts of, but I think, you know, it's, it's really asking, you know, having this two-way conversation. Much too much we have this one-way conversation, hoping our campaign will stick, hoping the hashtag will go viral, but, you know, how can we have that conversation? And one thing I like about, for example, TikTok, so the latest social media channel, is not just a platform where you can host uh, vertical videos, but it's really that, you, in order to do a good TikTok video, you have to tell a story that is so engaging that the users will take the elements of that story and amplify it and create a, create a video you know, to the, with, for their audience, which I think it's, it's a huge challenge for communicators. Uh, and I love it because it's this, I have the in, impression it's you know, much more of a two-way conversation. You know, we're, we're talking, we're creating with users rather than just talking at them and, uh, and posting the video. Sure. Do you think um, digitalization has killed crea creativity, for example? Absolutely Is not. it dying out? No, I, no, it's, no I, I'm a big fan of digital channels and you know, the, the creativity on digital channels is just absolutely amazing. You know, uh, just, you know, I'm, I was a journalist, I was editing videos. If you had, in order to edit videos, well, you had to be working in a TV channel. Nowadays you do it on your mobile phone. And my, my daughter, she's, she's 11, she's not on social media yet, but she will teach me how, how to do it. You know? so, Creativity is there. Now, the creativity obviously, you know, depends on do we have the, the devices or, you know, are we, you know, are our children going out you know, being creative in the garden, in the, in the woods outside? Because, you know, that's what we, we want them to do at the same time, you know. But obviously, we'll, we live in a digital world, you know, so yes, our children are connected uh, and we are also connected, you know, and, uh, but we have to put those devices down when we sit at, you know, uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner. I think that is, you know, that's the rule in our family. For sure, I agree. Sam, do you have any uh, last remarks that you'd like to add? Yes, uh, digital communications, uh, just that field alone is so broad and we need to understand that uh, we uh, special knowledge, uh, experience, training, uh, is required to to work in this area and even to um, maybe develop policies and th think through how these tools apply to our work and our lives. So it's not just something that you pick up and think, oh, I just published something on Facebook or I tweeted something and now I'm a digital communicator. It's much more complicated than that today. TikTok compared to Twitter, for example, it's just, just a different approach to communications and you, you can get specialists just for Twitter or you can get specialists just for TikTok. And within that, you have to understand the algorithms. So you can see the whole list of things that are required to be good pro and proficient at digital. We talked about the digital divide. I think policy people need to have a strong tech background and digital background to be able to address uh, these challenges. Um, we see hearings in, in Congress in the United States, for example, where congressional leaders, they're, they're trying to catch up with the tech leaders in, in, uh, in these congressional hearings, but they just don't have the, the knowledge to be able to push back and, and design the right policies. But I, I see, um, but we're seeing that that's changing and I would suggest that, that inve investment in knowledge and skills uh, in digital is impo important. Right, thank you, Sam. Nancy, uh, can I please take your final remarks? Sure. I would say, you know, it's really exciting to be able to communicate and do this job, but it's also pretty hard on someone's mental capacity, particularly if you're working on topics that seemingly aren't getting any better, whether it's a climate crisis or in a UN context, various crises, famine, wars. So I think a real challenge for us, in addition to, you know, just the work-life balance that has been mentioned, is to also figure out how to help one another as colleagues 
and to really find some way to, you know, if you're a really great communicator, you're going to feel so strongly about the topic. So really help one another, you know, keep some perspective, share lessons learned. And then I have found, you know, an event like this, because I'm so busy normally just producing content, analyzing content, moving on to the next thing. So it's a real treat to be able to take some time out and have these kind of conversations with our peers. So thanks for organizing it. Thank you, Nancy. And Daria, your final remarks, please. Yeah, I would uh, fully endorse uh, Nancy's point. Um, I, I fully agree about uh, the fact that uh, moments as such are very relevant for communicators. And uh, I share some uh, sometimes the, the, the difficulty of uh, dealing and communicating about very relevant topic with a great impact on audiences which are spread uh, all over the globe. Um, so my plea would be to have more of these exchanges and more particularly um, as strategic communicators working uh, mainly on digital, um, have an eye on inclusion and share how uh, we are dealing in the respective organizations with uh, keeping an eye so as to leave no one behind, even when we uh, use mainly digital communication tools. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, Miklos Gasper, Matthias Lufkins, Nancy Groves, Sam Kwan Kruger, and Daria Sanchuji, thank you all for joining us. Well, that wraps up our Digital Strategies Reloading panel. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Sumi. Thank you, Sumei, for that very insightful panel with all of your guests, both here and abroad. <laughs> Greatly appreciate it.